Um, we're talking about state functions today, and two that we're going to talk about are enthalpy and internal energy. First of all, we're going to define what a state function is. A state function depends only on the present state of the system, not on the path by which the system arrived at that state. Uh, we could make an analogy perhaps by referring to altitude as a state function. You can reach an altitude of 10,000 feet by getting into an airplane or by walking up a mountain. And uh, once you reach an altitude of 10,000 feet, you are at that altitude, irrespective of the path you chose. In the same way, we can think of the energy content of a molecule being a form of uh, state function. When you construct a molecule, you arrive at that molecule, and that molecule has, an e has a fixed amount of energy within it. And if you break down that molecule, it will always release the same amount of energy based on its uh, architecture. Um, the change in internal energy depends only on the initial internal energy and the final internal energy. So just like the difference in altitude uh, between two points depends only on the altitude at the initial point and the altitude at the final point and not the path that was taken to get to the two different altitudes. So uh, we recall that internal energy is a combination of heat flow and work done by the system. But those two variables are not state functions, so they can, they can be any number of combinations. You can have a lot of heat with very little work. You can have almost all heat and no work. Uh, or you can also have a lot of work with very little heat. And the example that we see in the textbook, Brown and others, 10th edition, page 176, they show a battery being discharged using a coil or you can discharge a battery by running a fan. And the way you, re you would represent that in, in an internal energy diagram is, in the case of the coil, it's just generating heat. At the beginning you have a charged battery, at the end you have a dead battery, and X amount of heat has been produced. And all of it has come, all of the energy in the battery, all of the electrochemical internal energy of the battery was released in the form of heat. On the other hand, you could have the battery hooked up to a fan, so that the fan spins a blade and pushes air around, that's doing work, but the motor also warms up because the process is not 100% efficient, so it's also going to generate some heat. So you see the amount of internal energy change has been identical. You have a dead battery in both cases at the end, but in the second case, the battery has done some work. So the change in, in the two states, the internal energy at the beginning of the experiment and the internal energy at the end of the experiment, is the change in internal energy. So that change in internal energy is the same irrespective of the path that was taken to um, discharge the battery. You could envision a situation in which perhaps the fan blade was too heavy for the motor, so the fan would have done a lot more work, so maybe this amount would have increased, uh, or perhaps maybe because it's an inefficient process it would decrease the amount of work done and it would generate more heat. Either way, you end up with a dead battery at the end. Uh, when we think of gases doing work, it's kind of hard to picture. But if you can imagine a chemical reaction that produces gas, it's pretty easy to imagine that if the reaction takes place in a vacuum, the gases that expand from the reaction will have an easier time leaving the reaction site if there's no atmospheric pressure to intervene. If the reaction occurs in normal atmospheric pressure, when the gas is being produced, it collides with the air molecules as it's coming out of the reaction surface. So it has to do work to escape from the reaction surface, to expand away from the surface. And this is where we get the term P delta V. P being the pressure of the atmosphere, 